Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this session. Um, the session will be in English. Um, however, there should be translation devices around. If you allow me, I'll just open with a couple of words in Arabic to welcome everybody. Ahlan wa sahlan, Sayyidati Sadati, le jami al hudur. Yisharrafni liyom idarat. I'm honored to moderate this uh, closing session of the first day of interesting and uh, crucial discussions for the region. We need uh, to uh, greet the Jordanian people and wish them uh, a good day and uh, congratulate them on their Independence Day. Which will be the language of the session. Um, we're here today to discuss the foreign policy outlook at perhaps one of the most interesting, intriguing, and critical times for the region. It really is um, one of those moments when you try to think, what could be more pressing? Is it Syria, or is it Arab-Israeli peace, or is it uh, the unemployment that so many youth suffer from? And the list goes on and on, as I'm sure you've seen from the amazing panels that we have here at the Dead Sea. But really, I think it's, it's critical to be here in Jordan where you, you actually feel the pressing issues and you can actually see them from different viewpoints, whether it's in Mount Nebo or whether it's in Um Qais or other locations of Jordan. And of course, Jordan has bear, been bearing the brunt of many of the challenges in the region, whether it's the refugee issues or security issues. But I think Jordan is also a good example of how the region continues to succeed and continues to grow despite the challenges. So beating the odds is perhaps another example of how this region stands out from the world. Um, today's session will be hopefully quite interactive and we really encourage all of you participating here in the Dead Sea, but also those of you not lucky enough to be here in Jordan with us um, to join us through Twitter and email. It will be hashtag WEFFP in order to be with us and send in your questions, which we hope to incorporate. Um, there are many issues to discuss. Um, the, the, the main theme is in this regional context, how can leaders bolster security and enhance international cooperation, which is quite vague, but I suppose in a way allows us to take it in different places. And we're lucky to have such a distinguished group with us. Um, I will start by introducing, um, first of all, uh, well, I'm going to do this. We were going to do this alphabetically, but I think it makes much more sense to do it according to those sitting in this order. So I will be starting with Senator Robert Menendez, who's um, Senator from New Jersey and Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at the Senate. Um, next is uh, Mr. Nabil Al Arabi, who's Secretary General of the Arab League. We have Senator John McCain, who's Senator from Arizona and ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And then we have Mr. Amru Musa, who's the former Secretary General of the Arab League and also former presidential candidate in Egypt. And I was saying to both Mr. Al Arabi and Mr. Musa before we came here, it's great that we have the predecessor and the successor on stage. This is, this is the new Arab world order that we can have both of you on such good relations and sitting together. On um, very friendly terms. And on very friendly terms. There we go. This is, this is the Egypt that we aspire to. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, um, Mr. Francis Maud, who's Minister for the Cabinet Office of the UK. And so the way the session will run is um, we will be having a discussion first. And as, journal as a journalist, I'll try to be civil and not hog all of the time. And then we'll open the floor in about 45 minutes to your questions. <clears throat> so, um, Mr. Al Arabi, if you'll allow me, if I can start with you. Regional context, there are so many files that you're dealing with at the moment. But there's also a sense that this is a new Arab order that is emerging. Right. There are states that are changing. There are some states that those are worried will fail. And there's new alliances in the region. How do you assess the region at the moment? Thank you. To address the question that you have asked, definitely you are a new world order, uh, which was brought about uh, by what is usually termed the Arab Spring. Uh, the Arab Spring, if I may be allowed to say a few words about it, uh, I'll uh, confine my remarks to the following. 
uh, it has permeated the whole Arab world, not only those where uh, re regime change has taken place. Uh, the countries that the regime place has taken place, they all, including uh, Syria, which no change yet, uh, they are all, uh, they were all governed by uh, autocratic regimes in power for many years, and all came about by military coup d'etat. All of them. Some of them delivered, some did not deliver. But there has been a change. It's something that happens sometimes in 1848 in Europe, in 1989 in Europe, uh, something similar to that, not exactly, but something similar that happened. But it needed to be happened because all the people throughout the Arab world uh, are entitled to live in peace, in democracy, uh, are entitled to see human rights respected. So there is a change there. Uh, ultimately, uh, they, they are all going through turmoil now different stages, different countries, and according to it, each country has its own specifications. But uh, ultimately, what is uh, hoped will happen is that uh, a full-fledged democratic society will take place, where government will represent people, work for the people, and be, and be uh, uh, run by the people. Uh, this has not reached, we have not reached that stage yet. I hope it will come. Uh, but uh, the perennial problem in the Arab world is Palestine. If you want me to address it later, I'll do it. If you want me to address it now, I'll do You're it. You're free to address it now. Uh, because there, uh, one has to recognize that uh, the people, the Palestinian people, have been living under occupation for a very long time. And uh, this is not accepted in our modern world. They are denied all the rights. Uh, and uh, they are entitled to peace and security like everyone else. And they have declared very clearly that they are willing to live in peace, in peace ne uh, next side to Israel. Both should have peace and uh, security because their security cannot be achieved unless it is reciprocal. It has to be taken that into consideration. Uh, we are hoping now that uh, uh, with this new uh, at atmosphere, uh, that uh, it will be looked at that way. It's not acceptable anymore to go step by step. Uh, they have been doing that, the parties, uh, Israel and the Palestinians, for the last 20 years. They know each other very well now. And what is needed now is to make sure that the occupation will end. Nothing will be resolved when, unless the occupation ends. But and do, do you think, sorry, but do you think that given the state that the Arab world is in today, whether mm -hmm. it's what's going on in Syria, the Lebanese domestic problems, can we see an Arab-Israeli peace? So we see the Palestinians amongst themselves that, that have struggled with reconciliation. And on the other side, of course, the Israelis have many concessions that are still not even being discussed seriously enough. So do you think that the state of where we are in the region is leaning towards peace, realistically? First of all, I do not think to use concessions for what Israel has to do is acceptable because it's not a question of concession. When you are occupying each ca another country uh, and denying the people their rights, this is not a concession when you go back to what the Security Council has unanimously agreed upon mm -hmm. in 1967. Uh, but yet, to answer your question, yes, I think the time is, uh, is ripe now and uh, since the whole wor Arab world is changing, I think this should be the top priority to get mm -hmm. uh, Palestinian-Israeli peace, where both the Palestinian and the Israelis will have peace. Mm -hmm. And that's very important. And I think this matter was addressed by the delegation that went to Washington recently. And uh, uh, they did, uh, for the 10th time, say there is an Arab peace initiative that mm -hmm. if Israel will, will uh, withdraw from all the occupied territories, and the Palestinian state will be established fully on the, on the ground, not, not like now in a legal way. The, what will happen is that all the Arab countries are willing to live in a normal life uh, with Israel. And I think this is very important for the people in Israel, exactly as for the people in Palestine, that the whole area will live in peace for the first time in I don't know how many years, or never maybe before. And it's important to follow this through. Uh, Mr. Maud, if I can turn to you, of course, all eyes will be on the UK soon with the G8 uh, summit coming up. And of course, Palestine and regional affairs, especially Syria, will also um, feature high on the agenda of the G8. So can you tell us what are your priorities for the UK in the upcoming G8 summit when it comes to the region? Well, the three themes we've set out for uh, um, the uh, G8 conference. First of all, congratulations to our Jordanian hosts on, on Independence Day, great celebrations. 
um, and, and very glad to uh, join in those. Congratulations. Um, our three themes were about trade, tax, and transparency. Um, and it's, it's clear to me that, uh, as I think it is to most of us, that the Arab Spring was not just about political freedom. Um, yes, it did involve political freedom, but a lot of it was about prosperity and jobs and a people feeling alienated uh, from a regime and from the fruits of, of growth uh, and being denied a, a share in prosperity. Um, and um, all of these three things um, uh, are relevant to uh, the outcome, the uh, results of the Arab Spring. Um, actually, most governments around the world are facing a similar set of challenges, big budget deficits, uh, a public sector that has grown at the expense of the private sector, uh, and a level of debt that's growing and, and, and unsustainable. So we all face a similar challenge, which is encouraging investment, controlling the size and curbing the size of the public sector, encouraging investment in the private sector that delivers jobs and prosperity for our citizens. Uh, and um, all of these three issues, tax, ensuring international collaboration to um, attack uh, tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance, the promotion of trade, and a further effort to promote uh, trade, which again supports investment and, uh, and jobs. But particularly um, transparency. Alongside the G8, the uh, United Kingdom government is the co-chair of the Open Government Partnership, which was launched in New York uh, less than two years ago, already 58 participating governments around the world, as well as civil society organizations. We're co-chairs with the Indonesian government who will take over from us uh, in October. And the truth is that transparency is an idea whose time has come. Um, I can't remember who it was who said nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And transparency is the friend of reformers. Um, all in, in politics, all oppositions support transparency. They think it's a really good idea that government should be completely transparent. And then when they take uh, office themselves, they're very enthusiastic about transparency and openness for the first 12 months, while all they're exposing is what their predecessors have done. Uh, their enthusiasm tends to lapse uh, after that time. Uh, but this increase in accountability, uh, the uh, ability that transparency gives to fight corruption, which we know is attacks prosperity, attacks growth, uh, is, is a very powerful feature in government's ability to deliver growth and prosperity and jobs. But it's also key in helping to uh, embed um, political change, political reform, uh, because actually what's central to both freedom and uh, growth is the rule of law, mm -hmm. uh, is the sense that governments are, are just as much as citizens are and corporations are, they're subject uh, to the law. The accountability that comes with transparency is, is a key factor there. And I believe Jordan is the only Arab country to have signed up to the initiative? It is, um, and we uh, welcome that, and we've worked very closely with our J Jordanian colleagues uh, on that. I say 58 countries around the world have, have joined mm -hmm. um, at very different stages, both of economic and political development, but the key factor that joins them is that reformers see transparency as being their aid and their friend. Mm -hmm. But we'd like to see more uh, Arab countries seeking to join. And one of the things I'd love to talk to uh, Mr. El Arabi about is whether the Arab League could play a role in that. Mm -hmm. Well, Senator McCain, if I can turn to you, you know, transparency not only within Arab countries or between um, the countries of the region, but also transparency in relations with the U.S. And this has been one of the themes that I think a lot of people have been discussing, the relationship um, between the region and the United States. And I wanted to ask you, in your long history with the region, how you see these changes are actually impacting your interests, the United States' interests, but also your policies towards the region. 
Well, again, congratulations to the Jordanian people on the anniversary of their independence. And these are most trying times for the Kingdom of Jordan and its people as a result of the Syrian conflict, which we will discuss later on. Um, it was a little over two years ago in February of 2011 that then Secretary General of the Arab League and I met in Cairo. And we had a press conference afterwards, and we were extolling all of the accomplishments of the Arab Spring. And if you remember back at that time, we were pretty optimistic, and I remain optimistic, but I think perhaps we had ignored some of the lessons of history, and that is that revolutions are usually pretty messy and not a smooth transition. And at that time, I think many of us were not so worried about the rise of radical Islam as we were about the ability of these countries to restore their economies, law and order, uh, trade, uh, other factors that, um, especially, in, for example, in the, of Egypt and how the economic difficulties were of prime importance. And I don't, and I'm sure we did not anticipate this situation in Syria. I am confident that we did not uh, appreciate the full extent of a radical Islamic elements influence in literally all of these countries, whether it be Libya, uh, whether it be Egypt, whether it be um, any of the other countries in the region that have experienced the Arab Spring. And I worry that these elements who were not the ones who made the revolution. I'll never forget being with a young group of young people in Cairo and a young man pulled out his Blackberry and said, I can get 200,000 people in the square in three hours. Um, there was a certain exuberance there that I think has been at least dampened by ensuing events. So the hard part of revolution is not making a revolution, but it is implementing the goals of a revolution. And the region and each individual country has made varying degrees of progress or varying degrees of retrograde in this pursuit of the ideals that, frankly, are articulated in our Declaration of Independence, that all of us are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And so, as we watch the, the turmoil ranging from difficulties in Libya and the continued uh, influence of these brigades and their ability to paralyze the government to Cairo where clearly economic difficulties are worse even than they were some time in the past and then Syria, which we will talk about. And I think the one of the lessons we should draw from that is that each country is different. Each country has different challenges. Each country has different traditions. But I would also make an argument that Egypt is of particular importance because of its historic role in the world and its central position as far as the cultural and historic center of the Arab world. And that's why I worry about that country as much as any other. But I guess in summary, a revolution came, we applauded it, we were appreciative of the technology that facilitated it, and now the hard part comes and we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work indeed. It's, it's good you mentioned Egypt because of course we're, Mr. Musa is here with us and I wanted to ask him about Egypt. but. In, in a more broad context, the idea that now domestic audiences, the, the people have spoken in several of the Arab countries and, and in different voices, and the idea that now we would hope that policies are actually reflecting their aspirations. Do you think that's happened, whether it's in Egypt or other countries that witness revolutions? Well, thank you very much, and let me join uh, my colleagues in congratulating Jordan uh, on the occasion of the Day of uh, Independence. The question pertaining to the changes 
in the Arab world and in the Middle East is so basic, not only from a domestic point of view, but also regional point of view. People, after the revolutions in Tunis, in Tunisia, in Egypt, uh, and in the rest of the five or six countries with which the revolution started, uh, was clear that it is not only prosperity that uh, they were after, but dignity. Mm -hmm. The previous regimes, the autocrats, in fact stripped the Arab people from many of their feelings of dignity that we form a people that has a cause and a role and a history. But the prevailing feeling, and I believe this is an important point, felt that we are living in the 21st century while we in fact live a century back. And we reject this notion. We have to live our 21st century and we have to contribute according to the rules of the game as we see them in this century. And this is one of the major battles, conflicts, between different political currents in the Arab world, in Egypt, as well as in the uh, other countries. Uh, we want to be part of the 21st century, and we want to compete in order to get a place in the first row, as other countries have done, countries from the third world. This feeling of lack of dignity, of people being deceived by their autocratic regimes, and also the chances for them to live decently, formed the basis for this revolution. And many of us have seen it coming. It was very clear that things are not going to stay where they are, and that it is coming soon, very imminent. And I still wonder up to this moment, how come that those regimes haven't seen it coming? They were either overconfident, or the reports that they have uh, uh, used to read were always assuring them that everybody is loving them and ev everything is fine. Do you think there are Arab regimes blind to that possibility now? Excuse me? Do you think there are Arab regimes blind to that possibility now? Or do you no, think the lessons I don't think learned? so. I don't think so, but I'll come to this point, because there is also this appointment with the, the uh, performance of some of the re regimes that are ruling Arab countries now, but for different reasons. Uh, and perhaps this is the moment to, to, to speak about this point. The expectations were high after the revolutions, after El Tahrir Square, as Senator McCain was mentioning. So it is the Second Republic. It is the 21st century. It is a revolution. The young people, the high technology. And then the people found that there is no change. Poverty continues to be the poverty. Services continue to be as, as, as bad as they have been. The prospects for the future, for the 21st century, for the human rights, for democracy, so where are they? See. So there is a prevailing feeling of disappointment, of frustration today. That is to describe the domestic situation. Is it the final station? Of course not. This is a revolution. This is a new uh, era, uh, and uh, as you said, Senator McCain, uh, it is always like that, messy in the beginning. It might get better later on, but to get better, you have to follow certain rules of the game of how to get better. It is not only by praying that things will, uh, that will improve. It is by work, and by working with others, and by seeing how the Middle East, how the world is, do, is, is moving through education, through science, through cooperation, through, uh, uh, through correct uh, uh, and modern practices and ways of governing. I believe that this era will come and go, but change will be the name of the game. And I don't believe at all that there will be a U-turn in any of the countries that have witnessed the revolutions. In fact, this will spread step by step. And there is a generational transition. Mm -hmm. Now, within a few years, 
It is a new generation that is going to, uh, to assume power. All the old generation will just move away from the scene and you will find within a few years that it is a new generation that is ruling the whole of the Middle East and the whole of the Arab world. Now, with this optimistic view, not because of what is going on today, but because of what is going on today, impossible to stay. There is no performance. We see no results. We see no good things happening. We see no second republic or republics, for that matter, in many uh, uh, Arab countries. Now, I move to the regional uh, scene. As Dr. Al Arabi was saying, the Palestinian question is essential. We cannot move from an era to another, from an old Middle East to a different Middle East, not to mention new Middle East, but different Middle East, with the Palestinian question staying where it is, with the same practices, the same rules of the game, the same wrong approach, which is manage the conflict, don't solve the problem. This is unacceptable, and now everybody is opening his eyes and ears and ready to get in, including the young people, including the youth. It is not a matter for governments to decide. It is for the people now. The movement of democracy will not only play in domestic uh, considerations alone, but in the regional scene. Perhaps we'll address the issue of Syria later on. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Al-Arabi has given uh, priority to the issue of Palestine, I wish to answer your question about the consideration of the Arab world, the Arab countries, as to the possibility of doing some, you mentioned the word concessions. Mm -hmm. uh, on our part, I don't think the Arabs should make, give any further concessions. Any further concessions after the campaign of deception about concede, something will move, and then you concede, then nothing moves. Concede again, concede third time, fourth time, fifth time. This is the lesson of history that should not be done again. Uh, but we have a position, which is the Arab initiative. The Arab initiative, is, initiative of Beirut is very clear about where do we stand, our readiness to move a step for a step, and that we are ready for normalization, not only normalization, but even recognition of Israel collectively, if Israel also abide by the rules of the game and allow a Palestinian state to emerge. By the way, it's not Israel that allows, but the international, uh, uh, yeah. cert certain international support that allows yeah. Israel to have this privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that what, uh, what Secretary Jean Kerry has proposed is a good thing, to address it, address the problem, mm -hmm. and bring back the United States into the scene. I hope that this will be in terms of solving the problem rather than managing the crisis. Well, this leads us well. <laughs> this leads us to Senator Menendez. I wanted to ask you, um, Mr. Musa was speaking about the 21st century and what it means for the Arab world. Is the start of the 21st century going to see the start of a less engaged U.S. in the region, even though, of course, we've seen with Secretary Kerry and his involvement with the important issue of Palestine and the rights of the Palestinians and, of course, peace in the region. So, but I wanted to ask you about this issue of disengagement and whether actually we see that it's peace that will bring the U.S. to play a pivotal role in this period. Well, let me uh, first uh, also join uh, my colleague, Senator McCain, uh, in congratulating Jordan on its Independence Day and expressing the admiration that the United States has for Jordan, particularly in the way in which it has opened its doors to a great humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. and accepted an unprecedented number of Syrian refugees. And uh, we are both uh, uh, admirers of Jordan, and we seek to help Jordan in that respect. You know, with reference to your question, uh, as the chairman of the Center Foreign Relations Committee, I think that I look at your question in an even more broader way. We have a world in which we have challenges and opportunities, a world in which we can have a paradigm shift in our thinking from the interconnectivity of people and nations, uh, the need for sustainable development and economic uh, growth, uh, among many uh, populations in the world, uh, as well as uh, global governance issues 
and the promotion of democracy uh, uh, and uh, alliances to try to achieve that. And in that respect, uh, I see uh, not a lesser U.S. engagement in the region, but a greater one. Uh, and I think that uh, the presence of my distinguished colleague here, who has been uh, obviously in the region for, for some time, Senator McCain, uh, as the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee, and myself as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, is an expression of the importance of the region. I think that Secretary Kerry, in the midst of global challenges uh, in the world, the time that he has spent, the effort that he has spent in seeking a uh, solution uh, to uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, uh, conflict and the, the goal of, of achieving a two-state solution, living in peace and security uh, with each other, is incredibly important. Um, I think the fact that the United States uh, recognizes its national interests and its national security interests in the region uh, is pretty evident. Uh, by the action the Senate Foreign Relations Committee took just this past week uh, as it relates to Syria. Uh, in a strong bipartisan vote of 15 to 3, the committee uh, passed out legislation uh, to try to change the tipping point inside of Syria so that uh, the calculations of uh, Assad as well as other global leaders may change and we can stop the bloodshed and uh, seek a more inclusive uh, Syrian uh, society of the future and to prepare for that opportunity uh, as well as increase our humanitarian assistance. It's an expression uh, of the U.S. engagement, it's an expression of the U.S. engagement uh, when uh, I believe that we need to be more focused uh, both in a bilateral context as well in multilateral contexts uh, such as through the IMF and the World Bank on the question of economic development. If you have a population that is very young and very poor and hopeless in many respects, then you have the seeds uh, of uh, the type of change that you do not want to see. Uh, you have the seeds of those who in fact can be proselytized uh, for the purposes of extremism. And so uh, either we recognize that even in the context of national security, economic development, the opportunity to raise the standards of living uh, for people in this region as well as a policy more globally is incredibly important because as individuals rise in their economic standing, they make greater demands on their government for transparency as well as for uh, freedoms and democracy, create greater stability within their own country and within the region, and of course create growth uh, in a global trade context. And so uh, I think that the United States, uh, and certainly uh, it is my expectation that our committee as part of the foreign policy process of the United States, will drive to be very engaged in the region, and will also, I hope, drive to look at economic development and opportunity as a core principle and necessity in order to create greater stability uh, for the region, greater prosperity for the region, and greater democracy for the region. Uh, it is up to uh, the people of the countries in which the Arab uh, Spring took place to realize the fulfillment of their revolution, but it is, I believe, a role that we can play in working within the region and listening to leaders within the region and where we can and agree to incorporate uh, their views as to how we create the opportunities and the development that can, I think, create more sustainable long-term uh, peace and prosperity. And I personally, after spending 20 years in the Congress between the House and the Senate, I think that too often uh, we are focused on the symptoms rather than the causes. And if we focus on the causes, it will be in the national interest and security of the United States and our partners at the end of the day to achieve the type of world in which we all aspire to. And so I think you will see not lesser U.S. engagement, but greater U.S. engagement. I think you'll find... Yes, may, may yes of course. Comment. Uh, at the beginning, you did mention concessions, and I told you mm. it's not mm. by Israel. But I... And, uh, Mr. Musa elaborated further on it. I just want to point out something, perhaps uh, I'm not sure uh, 
I'm sure that two senators know about that, uh, but anyhow, I would like to make it because territorial concessions have been made. Palestine was till 1947 100% Palestinians. Then the partition resolution gave, gave the majority, gave the majority 44%, which the United Nations itself was about to change. It didn't happen because the mediator who was working on it was assassinated in Palestine. Uh, without getting into that. Uh, but then the Palestinians now, and after the uh, latest agreement with Israel, they accept 22%. So if they have already made the concessions. If someone should make any concessions, so it, this it, was, it's this not was the, the Palestinians point. anymore. It's not the point. It's fact. Yes, this is the point I wanted to ask um, Senator Menendez. Um, because as you said, you know, it's, it's rather than treating symptoms, we need to go to the cause. And I think you'll find vast majority of Arabs will say to you, the cause remains of many of the problems in the region, the lack of peace and the lack of the rights of the Palestinian people. So in, in your, of course, very important distinguished position at, at the Senate, do you think there is that um, support in the U.S. that, that so to speak, political will to actually go the whole way this time and press as much as possible. Of course, in the U.S., they'd say both sides, us in the Arab world, we would say the Israelis, um, to actually go the final mile and actually try to come to an agreement on a solution that I think just about all of us know what it looks like, but it just takes the courage to, to go ahead. And Well, I do not think that President Obama would have given the green light to Secretary Kerry to spend as much time as he has spent and as much effort and a fair amount of capital to try to uh, uh, do anything less than achieve the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the midst of Iran, whose march to nuclear weapons is a national security threat uh, to the United States and the Western world, in the midst of the incredible humanitarian uh, tragedy that is Syria with 80,000 lives lost and one and a half million people displaced outside and nearly five million displaced inside, uh, and in the midst of a whole host of other challenges in the world, mm -hmm. I think that the, the focus of time and effort of Secretary Kerry is an expression of the administration's view to try to seek the goal. Now, I, I understand from the Arab world that it is all about Israel. My view is that you have to create a set of conditions in which it is win-win for both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, that one wins and the other one loses is a failed proposition. At the end of the day, having a win-win situation, which I think can be devised, uh, is the ultimate goal. So I think uh, the will is clearly there, uh, as expressed by the commitment of time, effort, and capital, uh, that is political capital that mm -hmm. has taken place. Mm -hmm. So I think um, at this juncture, it's, it's important to, while focusing on the possibilities of peace in the region, there's also the many um, terrible uh, I, you know, you get lost for words to describe what's going on in Syria. It's a war, it's civil strife, it's, it's a humanitarian crisis on the highest level. And I wanted um, to ask uh, Mr. Al Arabi to, to, to comment on this, uh, on, on the Syrian issue, and whether, in fact, on the Syrian issue, on the Syrian issue. And, and, and to, to ask you whether, in fact, you know, there is already intervention in Syria from different sides. You know, we before used to say, should there be intervention? Well, I think now just about everybody agrees there's, there's different types of intervention that's happening in Syria. Do we believe that, or do you believe that, the Arab League continues to have the capacity to lead on this? Is this something that the Security Council eventually will have to go to? And is Geneva too a possibility to succeed? Thank you. At the beginning of this crisis, which really is a full stage uh, catastrophe by any by any means uh, it was clear that uh, intervention by the arab league which we did at the beginning to try to convince the uh, president as i went to see him myself three times uh, that what is needed now is that fighting there was no war mm -hmm. there were people in the street claiming for liberty claiming for freedom exactly as in Egypt or in Tunisia or any, or any of these countries. Uh, but they were met with brute force by the authorities. And we were telling him, please, this should stop. Uh, prisoners should be released. And genuine, meaningful, political uh, reform should take place. Under him, no one spoke about anything else at that time. He refused. Foreign minister went the same plea. 
he didn't cooperate, then uh, there was a resolution to stop the fighting. And strange enough, it was accepted by the Syrian government, but it did not abide with it. Mm -hmm. At that time, we sent observers, and for the first time we do that, we sent observers. Uh, however, fighting was going on, observers were few. They have to go to sleep and eat, mm -hmm. and when they are not in their place, people were killed. Yeah. Uh, at 22nd of uh, January 2012, the Arab League, as the charter prescribed, charter of the United Nations prescribes, because the, the League is a regional organization under the United Nations, it's chapter 8 of mm -hmm. the charter, it referred the matter to the Security Council. Because the, when it comes to war and peace, it's the Security Council. Yeah. And the Security Council really has failed to do anything now. Now we have uh, a full-fledged uh, civil war. Uh, to me, it has some four dimensions. The first is the fighting, and the bloodshed is going on uh, for a very long time. Uh, reports say 80,000 have died, maybe even more, I don't know. Uh, something which no conscience can accept. Uh, then you have the question of the humanitarian catastrophe in the whole country. Then third, you have also the question of the spillover to the countries in the region, mm -hmm. which is creating chaos and turmoil in many countries in the region, which cannot go on for, for, forever. I think we heard today what uh, His Majesty King uh, Abdullah have said about uh, Jordan having 10% of its population. Actually, when I had the audience with him later on, he even told me now it's more than 10%. Of the, of the whoever, whoever is in Jordan, and we, they have scarce resources, they cannot go on like that. And then there's a very important and problem that w the whole world should focus on from now. What will happen in the day after? Mm -hmm. In the day after when fighting will stop, whenever it's going to stop. This country, how it's going to be rebuilt? What, what kind of reconstruction is needed? What kind of resources will have to cover for that? So it's really a very, very complicated and serious problem. And uh, I do hope that the Security Council uh, will uh, stand up and hold the Charter and try to carry out its responsibilities by, first of all, stopping the fighting. Yes. If we notice from 1945 till now, in every part of the world, when fighting takes place for a long time and so many people die, the Security Council will intervene, stop the fighting, and then the political solution will come. Mm -hmm. You cannot expect to, that the fighting will go on and, uh, forever and you will not do something about the people who are dying. So I think this is a very important matter that has to be addressed. Senator McCain, if I can ask you, you you've been um, one of those voices that have said for a political solution to be possible, then the opposition has to be supported with further arms, further um, assistance from the international community, including um, the U.S., in order to shift the military balance in Syria and let the regime come to the negotiating table in a position where it knows that there will be force. On the other hand, of course, there are others that say putting more arms into a situation like Syria can only lead to more death. How do you respond to that? Well, I won't repeat the statistics of what has happened in over the little over the last two years. The million and a half refugees, the 80,000 massacred, the torture, the murder, the rapes, the gang rapes, the refugees, and I say with respect, to say stop the fighting is a great phrase, but the fact is that until the battlefield equation is tilted against Bashar Assad, there will be no incentive for him or, the, or his patrons, the Iranians and the Russians and Hezbollah, to stop the conflict, to stop the fighting. And the massacre that's going on right now is an offense to the world in general and the United States of America in particular. I would like to say under the leadership of Senator Menendez, we did pass legislation which I'm confident will pass the Congress that calls for the provision of weapons to the right people uh, who are fighting for freedom. And I appreciate very much the leadership that he has given to our committee and the United States Senate. Um, in the words of Mr. Bismarck, if we keep going to that same over and over, let's get the Russians 
to change, uh, one grows a little weary and one grows a little cynical. The words of Mr. Bismarck, I'm afraid the issue will be decided by blood and iron because that's the only thing that Bashar Assad understands and that's the only thing that the Iranians understand, that's the only thing Hezbollah understands, and it's the only thing that the Russians understand. And it's a shameful chapter, it's a shame, shameful chapter in the history of this world that we have stood by and watched this slaughter go on without acting. It's an unfair fight, my friends. It's not a fair fight. We know that Syrians are being trained in Iran and sent back. We know that Hezbollah has admitted to be in the fight. We know the evolutionary, re Iranian Revolutionary Guard has stated openly that, they're, that they have boots on the ground. And so it's a shameful chapter. And for us to sit by and watch this happen is not only an offense to our everything we stand for and believe in, we are now seeing the spread of this conflict to surrounding countries which could engulf the whole region. So there's more than a humanitarian side to this. Our late, our General Mattis, the head of our Central Command, testified before the Congress of the United States, the fall of Bashar Assad would be the greatest blow to Iran in 25 years. They lose their connection with Hezbollah. They lose the, the, the cohesion that has allowed them to take, make such mischief throughout the Arab world and the world. But Senator, so okay. let me just finally say, and I'm sorry for the long tirade, but we have a chance to act. And now we're going to wait until Geneva too. And I am convinced that the, neither the Russians nor anything good is going to happen unless the Russians are convinced that Bashar Assad is going to lose. And that is not the situation on the battlefield today. Senator McCain, I wanted to ask you, but you said in order to provide arms for those that are on the ground that you can, you can be sure of, but can you? Can sure you, we can. can. <clears throat> Same way we were able to in Libya when we gave them a safe haven in Benghazi. They need a safe haven. They need to neutralize the air assets of Bashar Assad. In this climate, in this terrain, uh, air is a decisive asset. And uh, we need to move the Patriot missiles down closer to this safe zone. We need to give them the weapons, and it's heavy weapons, and ammunition, which they're always short of, and an ability to organize and to govern and then take over. Every day that goes by, we know more and more jihadists flow into the region and more complicated the post-Assad period will be. And finally, one more issue that we have also not planned for, and that sees caches of chemical weapons which are falling in the hands of the wrong people can have catastrophic consequences. We should be planning now with our allies in the region and in NATO and around the world to be prepared to secure these caches of chemical weapons before they go into the wrong hands and maybe the next bomb that goes off in New York may not just be nails and hardware. Uh, Mr. Maud, I want to ask you, in Europe, how much of an appetite is there for that sort of role in terms of providing arms? Of course, the UK and France have been open in saying Could that I there's a Could I just finally e mention, yes. no American boots on the ground. <laughs> <I didn't laughs> yes, you've, been, you've been quite clear in your statements previously <laughs> not to have boots on the ground. And, and perhaps uh, that is the legacy of Iraq. It's been 10 years since the Iraq War, and perhaps that's one of the legacies of the Iraq War, not to have boots on the ground. Um, however, that doesn't stop the complications. And I wanted to ask, you know, there's the meeting in Luxembourg on Monday to discuss um, the amending of the arms embargo on Syria at the moment, and France and the UK have been quite clear in their position. Do you think the rest of Europe could come um, onto the side of the UK and France who have been leading on this effort and actually accept an amendment? Well, I, we hope so, uh, but it is a very mixed picture. Um, Britain and France are forward-leaning in this. Uh, we share a lot of the concerns that Senator McCain has set out. I mean, every day that goes by, more people are being killed and, and, and maimed. Uh, that the, uh, Every day that goes by with the regime uh, still in place, thinking that they have a chance of winning, uh, means that there's less... Uh, chance of it coming to a swift end, and Syria, that uh, country which is full of such promise, it will be able to rebuild. 
Um, so uh, we want this to be able to be brought to an end as, uh, as soon as possible. Um, and, uh, of course, the history of these uh, matters tends to be the longer you leave it, the worse it is, and, and the longer it then takes uh, to resolve. Uh, and you know, we want this to be brought to an end before there's nothing left but a heap of rubble. Um, Mr. Moussa, you're, of course, uh, one of the most renowned diplomats of the Arab world. Do you think a diplomatic solution is in sight, or we'll see much more bloodshed before we can come to that? Let me first say that I am really flabbergasted by what I heard and read even before that. Now, the U.S., Britain, and the West are getting ready to provide arms, weapons, to the, uh, those on the streets. The rest of the story is that Russia is going to provide the regime with weapons. They are, and, they are, and, they are already. They are, uh, they are already, yes, but more weapons, and uh, the comments are abound on that. So this, is, this would lead to an escalation in the military action in Syria. More destruction, more casualties, and more refugees, and more displaced persons. Okay. This is one scenario. Now, I'm just describing. I'm, I'm, this is not, I haven't yet commented on that. <laughs> then, the other scenario is that the U.S. and Russia are getting together to call for a conference, cooperating, calling on parties to negotiate the government and the, what, the revolutionaries, the resistance, call them as you like. So this is another scenario. So it is a very dangerous situation that Syria is going one way by way of military confrontation and the other way by sitting and trying to reach an understanding. How can we reconcile both things? I believe the solution is what Dr. Al-Arabi has just said, the Secretary General of the Arab League, that the Security Council has to address the situation and call for immediate ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And then starts the negotiations. That is, all this is number one. Number two, the understanding as we see promoted between the U.S. and Russia is calling for diplomatic solution meaning that the regime and the opponents would sit together and negotiate. Meaning that the, what we heard about removal of President Assad and that he has to immediately leave his office has been abandoned to a different set of rules that now he can stay, he will negotiate, he will send a delegation presided over by the Prime Minister and a powerful delegation to the point that we read yesterday or before yesterday that the government in Damascus is really thinking of going or not going. It is up to their assessment to see whether it is useful to go to, uh, to uh, Geneva or not to go. The Syrian issue, in my humble opinion, as just a private citizen following the news and the developments. It's a good luxury to have. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was wrongly addressed from the beginning. It was not only a case of so-called Arab Spring mm. from the very first minute. Yes, indeed, it has this side, but the rest is different. We should have addressed that under the title Syria slash Iran. Iran is very much involved there. And perhaps to add to what the senator was saying, and I was commenting on that, that a mere deal between Russia and U.S. will not suffice, suffice to solve the problem. Iran is part of this problem. It has to be addressed. And the Arab world has to be present. The Arab world is the owner of the senior scene, the, the Syrian scene. The Arab world has to be there. Iran, in my opinion, I believe Nabil Arabi agrees with this point of view, is that Iran should be invited to the Geneva conference. So it can be part of the solution and rather than just that part of the problem. Convenes. In short, a lot of confusion. So many scenarios going in different directions and the people of Syria and the surrounding countries, including this country, Jordan, mm -hmm. are going to suffer a lot, whatever the result. Could I just say in response to my friend, we will be at other conferences 
at other times in the coming years. We'll see who is right. I'm all for a conference. I'm all for peace talks. All right, and nothing that's better. Mm -hmm. But as long as Bashar Assad believes that he can win and he's winning right now, there is no motivation to stop the fighting. If I may, just I appreciate the desire to see the Security Council Act and the United States has led with its allies in trying to seek a vote of the Security Council, but has been rebuffed by other members of the Council. And so unless the dynamics change in which the other nations on the Security Council who have used their veto and their abilities uh, not to allow the Security Council to move forward changes, the dynamic of seeking a Security Council resolution won't be realized, which then leaves the question to arm or not to arm. That question is past us. There are tremendous use of arms already as has been established inside of Syria. The question is where the vetted moderate forces uh, can have the ability to change the tipping point, to change Assad's calculation as well as its patrons. Uh, that reality doesn't exist today. Uh, some of the most extreme ele uh, elements inside of Syria are the ones who are best armed and best trained. Uh, and that creates a real challenge. So uh, I would wish that the Security Council would move in concert with what the United States and its European allies have promoted. Uh, but that has not been the case. And unless that calculation of uh, Russia and others change, uh, then we will not see a Security Council resolution and the present status quo would continue. Uh, I think that that is not acceptable. And I, I, would, I would also say that, um, you know, uh, I find it uh, hard uh, to believe uh, that uh, a country like Iran is going to provide a serious uh, effort to be helpful in this conflict. It's not being helpful when it has overflights uh, and sending uh, resources to Assad. It's not being helpful when it is training an enormous number of Revolutionary Guard, retraining them to come to Syria. It is not being helpful when it moves Hezbollah uh, in significant numbers and resources uh, in Syria. So uh, I think that uh, there is no great option here. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, how do you change the dynamics as they exist today? And while I am also uh, hopeful uh, for the conference that will be held, I find it uh, difficult to believe uh, that uh, uh, Assad would, either through his uh, uh, representatives or others, seek to go there for the purposes of removing himself mm -hmm. from power. So, uh, you know, that, that I'm not overly optimistic about the conference as a result. If you allow me, because what I've said really has been uh, said now by the senator. A little, a little I've been said now by the senator because uh, the point I wanted to make, make is that uh, studying the fightings going on in various parts of the world since the Second World War, there is no one single pattern to end the war. Vietnam and here Senator, uh, of course, McKean uh, knows everything about it and suffered a lot. Uh, in that war, uh, negotiations started in Paris while fighting was going on at one time. In other parts, let's say in the Middle East where we live, always negotiation to reach a settlement whether it was rich or not, followed a ceasefire. Uh, this is a very complicated matter because mm -hmm. it's also a question of civil war and there are outside powers. It's a war by proxy between certain parts. And that makes it much more difficult. So one has to be innovative, one has to be imaginative, but the main thing is to start. Uh, I don't have high hopes, to be very honest, on the conference that it will succeed. Uh, but uh, it's the only opening before us now. Mm -hmm. Unless, could... unless it's, it, it meets, it convenes, and we should not really make who should participate as an obstacle to me, to the con con convening the meeting. It's very important yes. to convene the meeting. We don't want uh, it to become, again, talks about how the no, talks No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. This will be really uh, disastrous for mm -hmm. the whole area. Time is off the what, what has to be done is quickly mm -hmm. to get a meeting and uh, see if come, something could come out of it. Uh, I think the, the opposition, though it's very disorganized, 
very disorganized. I, I agree, I've been seeing them since September 2011. However, uh, they have one message, they want a new regime. And this is very important, regardless of their own views. Uh, what is important now is to see, because the meeting is going to be, if it meets, uh, it's going to be uh, governed by a certain uh, framework or parameters, which is Geneva 1. The final communique of 30 June 2011 made it very clear. What has been agreed upon is A, to start a new transitional period, and B, to form a national unity government by mutual consent to, be, to have full executive powers. So there is the parameters is there. Once the meeting will uh, will be convened, you can walk it through with the right, of course, uh, pressure for every, for everyone. Of course, we can discuss Syria to no end and all the other issues of the region. But I want to give a chance um, to the floor to ask questions. But I promised Mr. Musa that he would um, get in his final remarks. So please, a brief remark, and then if you can prepare uh, your questions. I have just we'll a brief comment on what Senator Ferdinand is saying about the Security Council. Now. You will recall that at the beginning, Russia and the U.S., or Russia and the West, were at cross purposes, at odds, insofar as the situation in Syria was concerned. Now there is an understanding between Russia and America. So the prospects are better in the Security Council than it has been at that time. Now, if we want to achieve what Dr. Arabi was saying now about ceasefire, about stopping the, 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 the uh, confrontation and so on, it is for the Security Council to decide that, not for the uh, conference in Geneva. Geneva is a conference. And if you recall what happened with Geneva 1, okay, that was very good, and good documents came out of it, but so what? Where, we are, where are we? Geneva 2 will have the same effect. If we want to establish a transitional period, it is for the Security Council to establish that not for a conference and speeches in Geneva. It is time for the Security Council, especially that the U.S. and Russia started to follow one path, to a great extent at least, as, as we see it now. This is time for Security Council. Thank you. Can I remind so my friend you. that we would never have gone to Bosnia if we had relied on the U.N. Security Council. Mm -hmm. We would never have gone to Kosovo if we'd relied on the U.N. Security Council. We stop genocide there. Genocide is taking place in Syria on a much larger scale today than was the case there. Okay, so I will, I will I, I'm losing control of my panel. No, no, but but <laughs> just one word. But the one final word, the please. The difference that situation in Bosnia and Kosovo and now is there is agreement between U.S. and, 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 and Russia. Yeah. There, is a, there is a difference. The Russians objected strenuously to Kosovo. Mm. We, we, will, we, we did, will have to wait. We did not require the United Nations. The point that my friend Mr. Musa just made was that we have to go through the Security Council. We did not in Bosnia or Kosovo. That's a fundamental point. Okay. So with that point, I'm sure we'll have many more questions on Syria, so we'll keep the conversation going. Um, the gentleman in the third row here, um, if you could kindly identify yourself, and if your question is for a particular member of the panel, please also let us know. Uh, my name is Bara Shaiban. I'm from Yemen, uh, from the Global Shapers uh, Sana'a Hub. Um, my question is for Mr. McCain, and maybe uh, Senator Menendez can also respond to that. Um, the United States, I mean, um, I, I, I personally think that it's very courageous that it made the decision to maybe arm the freedom fighters in Syria, but the United States had an experience before with arming fighters, that happened in Afghanistan almost 20 years ago, or even more. Aren't you afraid that the same experience, like you might face again in Syria? Absolutely not. The American people would never, and the American Congress would never subject, uh, allow American boots to be on the ground. Although, I have to emphasize, there's this issue of the chemical weapons caches in Syria that's going to have to be addressed on an international basis, not the United States uh, alone. Um, Americans, as we all know, are war weary, and that would not be, they would not allow such a thing. But second of all, I don't think American boots on the ground would do anything but have a negative effect and on, on 
the whole situation. I just want these people to be able to defend themselves in a fair fight, and that would mean negating uh, Bashar Assad's air assets because that is a huge and decisive factor, as we found out in Libya, uh, in any conflict in this terrain, in this climate. Bob? Well, I, I would just simply say I think that we, after two years of dealing with the opposition and working uh, with our allies, uh, have a pretty fair idea as to who we could be supporting and who would share our values and who would be, if they were in power, all in a more inclusive Syrian society. So uh, the legislation that was passed out of our committee, and I believe that the, the Senate would ultimately approve, uh, has vetting entities to ensure that as best as possible. There's always some degree of risk. It is not hermetic uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but we believe that we have come to a point uh, after two years of dealing with the opposition of and working with our partners, including here in the region, who is someone, who are the entities worthy of supporting and not having the concern that you raised? Okay, there's a question from the middle there, please. Hi, my name is uh, Wasim Mukahal. I'm from Lebanon, who uh, is actually also today celebrating an important anniversary, the liberation of South of Lebanon from Israel. Um, my question... <laughs> My question is directed to Senators McCain and Menendez. Senators, there has been a deep-rooted mistrust between the Arab street and the Arab population and the United States where it comes to its foreign policy. Three very quick examples of this mistrust. The Arab street for decades sees the U.S. as a staunch uh, sup uh, supporter of Israel in every measure the Israeli government takes. Um, as a matter of fact, the Knesset is more... Uh, questionable of its governments and questions topics like the settlement building, whereas these topics are taboos and considered political suicide on Capitol Hill. In addition, the Arab Spring, which you today are supporting, <laughs> has been an outcry of the Arab people against dictators who you and the American government have supported for decades. Okay. And I won't so, even start talking about... So if we about, can get to the question, yes, which, the, are, which are all pertinent questions, and I'm sure many Arabs have this on their mind, but just so that we can give a chance to... The question people. is, how do you ever envisage gaining the trust of the Arab street and the Arab population? And when will the U.S. foreign policy actually reflect the inalienable and self-evident truths that are reflected in the Declaration of the Independence? Well, first of all, sir, I'm proud of the United States of America. I am proud of what we've done on behalf of democracy and freedom throughout the world, throughout our history. You can name almost every major conflict of the 19th and at least certainly the 20th century where the United States led and was dedicated and sacrificed American blood and treasure in all four corners of the world, usually in defense of someone else's freedom. So I take offense at your characterization of the United States of America, sir. So I, but I will respond to your, to your question. As far as the Arab-Israeli issue is concerned, uh, Palestinian-Israeli situation, we know it has to be uh, addressed. And American presidents, both Republican and Democrat, have made very strong, good-faith efforts. I happen to be a great admirer of President Bill Clinton. And at Camp David, with that close to an agreement, and it was Yasser Arafat that decided that the answer was no. And we all know, we all know what the outlines of an Arab, Israel, a Palestinian Israeli peace process is. It's the Camp David Accords that they, that they almost uh, reached. Again, uh, we spoke out on behalf of human rights like no other nation in the world, including Arab nations are not speaking out for human rights as much as the United States of America is. We have conditioned aid, we have conditioned assistance, we have come to the aid of people that are beleaguered throughout the world, and I'm proud of our record, and I'm proud of both Democrat and Republican administrations, and it's not an accident that the 20th century was named the American century, and I believe the 21st century can as well. Thank you for your comments. Sentiment. Well, let me let me just join Senator McCain in this. You know, I, I reject your premise 
I respect your right to ask it, but I reject your premise. Uh, tell me who has spent more lives in national treasure uh, in the freedom of people uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan? Where has the standard of for women in a country like Afghanistan risen so dramatically? What other country in the world did as much? We have allies that have done, but what other country in the world has done so much? What other country has been as continuing in its effort financially to the Palestinian Authority uh, to help it meet uh, its governance uh, challenges? Uh, and so, you know, this is uh, a reality uh, uh, of clearly misperception. Uh, because if you ask the, the mothers and fathers of those who have lost their lives in the pursuit of individuals' freedoms, they do not think that, in fact, uh, that the shedding of the blood of their sons and daughters uh, was not uh, for, in vain and certainly in the cause of freedom for many of uh, these individuals so who now enjoy uh, a greater freedom than they had. So uh, that's, that's really uh, not a view. And if you heard my comments, we talk about uh, the focus of creating new economic development opportunities for a population not only in this part of the world but elsewhere who is poor, very young, and who many times feel very hopeless. Uh, and the United States is actively engaged through USAID as well as to international organizations in trying to raise the standards of living for those individuals. So uh, I think it, it is, is wrong to believe so. And finally, there are many who said our interests, if we were just to pursue our interests, was not to stand with the people in Tahir Square, uh, but to stand uh, with uh, those who had been authoritarian uh, in governing them. And the reality is, is that that is not the position the United States took. So I think all those are demonstrable elements uh, that are of the highest order uh, of a different view than the one you possess. Um, I know there are many questions from the floor, which I will come back to, but we also have many people sending in questions through Twitter. And I want to pick up on, on this point that you spoke about development and economics, because we actually have a question from uh, Nader Abdel Qadir, who says, how can foreign policy serve collaboration between the MENA region and other countries in the field of research and technological development? And that brings me to um, the Deauville Partnership and other efforts that have been made in order to bolster some of the countries of the region, not necessarily just with finance, but rather with projects that would, um, that would help take us to a better place. So perhaps, Mr. Maud, you could um, speak about that particular issue, and especially with the Deauville Partnership. Well, the Deauville Partnership is, is very important. It's a, a lot of investment has gone into it. It needs to be built on uh, and built on rapidly. Um, and you know, there is no doubt that uh, if uh, across the Middle East and North Africa region uh, we see uh, conditions arising where, which are encouraging for investment, that will support all the other things we're talking about here. It supports conflict resolution. Uh, more prosperous people uh, want to resolve conflict more. They've got more skin in the game. More, it's, it, there's a, the, the stakes become higher. Um, and so it's very important that we do that. But there's something else as well, uh, which is that engagement, uh, detailed, substantive engagement on issues like technology transfer, uh, like uh, uh, collaboration on all, of these, uh, on all of these areas, actually gets dialogue onto things where it's easier to reach, um, it's easier to reach agreement. So I've uh, always been a huge... Um, uh, supporter of the idea that trade uh, is the best antidote uh, to conflict. By and large, peoples that trade together don't fight each other, uh, and because you have more and more vested interest in each other's prosperity and each other's uh, stability. So that's why in the context of the G8, uh, we have said that trade is one of the three big themes, uh, and to the extent that that can be promoted then it does contribute, not immediately, not overnight. Um, and it doesn't stop there being all the issues that have been talked about, particularly in the uh, Palestine-Israeli uh, conflict, where there need to be substantive concessions on both sides and for neither side 
are those easy concessions, but they're really important, but actually um, building the collaboration, building the engagement on things which are not to do with that conflict can be a really important uh, uh, precursor to success. And perhaps that's one of the lessons of Europe that the region can look to, you know, and maybe a hundred years ago, if you had said there would be no wars in Europe, that uh, and you would have such close partnerships between France and Germany, you'd say it would be impossible. And then, so we've seen it. Um, I'll take uh, more questions from the floor. There's a gentleman here. We need some women voices. Women, ask questions, please. Yes. Hi. Do you want to go ahead? No, no, no. Please, please. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Munir Atallah. I'm with uh, Your Middle East, and my question is for Dr. Al Arabi. Uh, my question is, can America be trusted as a moderator in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, given its history with the issue? And uh, how many more chances should we give America to facilitate this conflict before looking for new moderators? And do we even have a choice, or is anyone who tries to take that away from America going to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, crushed? I <laughs> <laughs> I think crushed might be a bit strong. But <laughs> to go straight forward to answer your question, uh, can America be the moderator? Yes, it can. It can. I was present myself uh, with President Sadat at Camp David in, in September 1978, uh, where the United States uh, made enormous efforts uh, with pressure on both sides to produce a peace treaty. Uh, so that I have seen that myself. Uh, the United States was a party, a very uh, active party in writing down resolution uh, 242, which called for withdrawal from the Arab countries uh, occupied or from the territories occupied in 1967, and and that peace and security will be on a reciprocal basis for both sides. So it can't do that. The United States uh, has a unique uh, power of persuasion, let's say, in uh, trying to uh, move the Israeli government, the present one, which is very difficult, uh, to attain peace for the Palestinians. Now you say, can we find out someone else, another moderator? Uh, I'll be very happy if you can p p point out someone who can, do the, uh, who can play this role in our modern world. Question here. Um, hello, my name is Perihan Alam. I am part of the Global Shapers uh, Cairo Hub. Well, I have two questions. Uh, my first question is um, for all the panelists. Uh, it's regarding the Israeli and the Palestinian conflict. Um, there has been a growing sense of uh, fear and suspicious over the latest changes made on the peace initiative uh, in a way that included the land swaps. So um, people have a growing sense that this might actually lead to more loss of lands or maybe uh, the loss of the 67 borders. And my second question is for uh, Mr. Mendez and uh, Mr. McCain. What do they think of the latest shift in uh, the U.S. drone scaling policy in Yemen and Afghanistan? Uh, and many other states. Was it for the sake of the hundreds of innocent Afghanistani and Yemeni people who were killed, or was that decision has been taken for other reasons? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Shall I? I th yes. Land swaps. It's a myth that grew out of proportion. You are speaking here, and I was part of the delegation that went to Washington. You are speaking here about two states. We never had two states there. Two states, and they have to define the borders. Define the borders. You have to do two things. Delimitate the border, which never existed, and then demarcate the borders. And when you do that, and I have spent five years with the borders of Egypt working on that as legal advisor of the Egyptian foreign ministry, uh, you need to go around areas and to do this and that. This is number one. Uh, number two, the Palestinians themselves, in their agreements in the past, not agreement, in their negotiations in the past, particularly under uh, Prime Minister Olmert, they found out by agreement that there would be perhaps changes of the border between them. 
uh, but the delegation in, uh, in, uh, in Washington, I think you are referring to that, made the three conditions that the Palestinians want. There has to be equal in, in space, so there is no loss of land. The, 40, the, the 22% will not be 21 and a half. Secondly, they have to be with the same value, value of the t terrain itself. And thirdly, by mutual consent. So where is the concession? I don't know. I, I would just like to thank my friends on either side of me for their many years of dedication to the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. All of us are very grateful. Did you want to say anything? Well, y yes, indeed, because the, the issue of swap was there on the table for so many years. But it dealt with the border line, and swaps should be astride the borders on both sides, not only on the Palestinian side, and equal in value and space. Value and space. So, in fact, when I read all the documents coming out of this meeting, I found that the Arab delegation remained within the parameters as indicated by the Arab initiative, which is there, and it will not be amended under no circumstances. It could be amended. It is fair, it is balanced, and nothing else could be done concerning it. But the Israeli side created a myth that, yes, indeed, there is now swap of land. They were thinking of the settlement, and they talked about 10% or something of that kind, more or less. And that shows that it is an impossible proposition. It has to be on the borders, within a very limited uh, surface, and equal as we have agreed. So it, the, the concession, the, the idea of swap was there. But the amount was limited, and I believe there was some kind of understanding, some kind between uh, Mahmoud, President Abbas and former Prime Minister Olmert on that, just to start. And then it went down the drain. Uh, Senator could I, Mendes, could I you... mention the other part of the question? Yes, sure. Yeah. I was, I was going uh, to allow Senator Mendez you. and then come to yeah, you. Uh, yes. as, to the, as it relates to your second part of your question, uh, I would say to you, what do you think of the 3,000 lives that were lost on September 11th, including 700 from my state of New Jersey? Uh, what do you think of the bombings that took place uh, on Amer at American uh, bases and uh, American uh, uh, facilities uh, and took lives? Look, uh, the reality is, is that, uh, personally speaking, uh, I would not second-guess uh, the um, the government of the United States to pursue the national security of its people, like I would not uh, doubt any other nation's right to pursue the national security of its people. Uh, but uh, I think it has been, we, we live in a new time. These are stateless actors. Uh, these are not uh, the times, and we have individuals for which uh, their glorification is in dying, not living. And that is a challenging set of circumstances, which goes to my original question. It's trying to change the dynamics of the root causes versus just simply the symptoms. But uh, I always ask people who ask me this question, uh, what about the 3,000 lives that were lost on September 11th? Uh, that is the nature of the responses we have had since. And it is a continuing challenge to the national security of the United States of actors uh, who in their extremism uh, continue to seek the death of Americans uh, both at home and abroad. And that is the challenge we face. And within that challenge, we probably go to enormous pains to try to ensure that we go after only those of us, only those who are trying to, in essence, kill Americans. Uh, but as in any set of circumstances, this is not the simplest set of circumstances under which we are pursuing those who, in essence, want to kill our citizens. And so I will not apologize uh, for uh, the United States protecting its citizens, uh, which I fully would expect. I'd just, like to, I'd just like to remind you that after the attacks on Washington and New York, the United States of America did not declare war on Afghanistan. They demanded that those responsible 
who were based in Afghanistan that be get turned over to the United States. The Taliban refused to do that. This is what triggered our invasion of Afghanistan. And I am sure that you and other professional women especially would not like to see a return to the reign of the Taliban and the abuse of women's rights, which was their doctrine. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I believe that we should try to preserve a free and democratic society in Afghanistan with all the problems and challenges that we face. I believe it's possible with a sufficient force left behind that we can leave Afghanistan and have our assistance with them in a number of ways militarily that we may see a long, hard path, but democracy and freedom and rights for all, including women in Afghanistan. Well, there are so many hands up, and I do apologize to you because we are coming to the end of the session, and I would not dream of um, keeping you all behind. So just to wrap up, I mean, it, there are so many topics, of course, that we did not have a chance to touch upon. We have the Iranian elections coming up um, mid-June. We have Iraq on the border of Jordan. You know, we, we don't know what will happen there with um, all the difficulties, of course, Lebanon and so forth, and Yemen. And then we didn't even touch upon Libya and Tunisia that have witnessed historical changes. And, and perhaps it's indicative of just how, in one sense, rich this um, region is for all the topics that are pressing for the world. It's, it's no longer just about us. But I think that the one defining factor is that there is a lack of trust, and whether there is a lack of trust between countries or whether there is a lack of trust between peoples and their governments or a lack of trust towards the United States or some of its allies. This is, I think, one of the, the themes that has really come through. And I guess it's, it's venues like this that allow us to have discussions and even if we defer, be able to air those differences and, and discuss them to go forward. So with that, I would um, like to thank our panel for their time and, um, and I'd like to thank you for your questions. And I apologize for not being able to take more questions, but we had such a lively debate. So thank you. Thank you.